today we will see some more topics on centroids and additionally we will see area moments for your reference this is module 6 lecture number 14 of the engineering mechanics course in the last lecture we saw how to determine centroids by integration as well as by methods of simple decomposition to determine centroids for plates. Today we will extend the discussion to volumes and then we will move on to discuss the second moment of the area. So, for 3D solids the centroid can be determined by the integration and for common shapes these values are known. So, again for the 3D solids we determine the centroids by finding the first moment of the differential weights of the small elements that we take and then we integrate it to find the location of the centroid. So, here you see one hemisphere and the centroid of the same is located at this point C and since we have this symmetry along this diametrical plane the centroid lies in that and it lies at a distance of x bar from this diametrical plane and that distance is 3 8 3 a by 8 where a is the radius of the hemisphere and volume again by integration it can be found. So, for finding this we take let us say a small differential element with respect to this axis this is dv and its location is x So, we find this location x bar by writing x bar v is equal to integral x dv and for the hemisphere this v is the integral dv which is 2 by 3 pi a cube and once we know this v and this integral value we can determine this x bar. In the same way for other simple solids like cone and pyramid the location of the centroids can be found. In case of cone again we have an symmetry. So, it lies along this axis and it lies at a distance of h by 4 from the base of this cone and for this pyramid we have the centroid located at h by 4 from this base. Here we have an example where we find the centroid of a complex shape by decomposing it into simpler shapes and for these simpler shapes we know the location of the centroid and thus we can find the location of the centroid of a complex object. So, here you see an object constituting of several features like we have two through holes and some circular filleted region. This component can be split into a 
rectangular plate of say 0.5 inches thickness from which we have to remove these circular holes so negation of these volumes that is 3 and 4 and then we have to add the volume corresponding to this feature that is volume 2 and for these shapes the location of the centroid is known so the location of the centroid for this component can be written say with respect to the zy plane that is the location of say this is the x direction see the location of x bar for the sum of the volumes v1 plus v2 minus v3 plus v4 is equal to sum of the location of x1 bar v1 plus or here we can say we replace this plus x2 bar v2 minus x3 bar v3 minus x4 bar v4 and for these shapes we know these values and so from this and volumes are also known from this we can find this quantity same way we can find the location of the centroid with respect to the other principal planes. Centroids can be found by the method of direct integration for analytical surfaces. If we take a surface whose equation is of the form z equal to function of x comma y which is an now the surface is an analytical surface since we have the definition of the surface in terms of these coordinates so we can find say the centroid of the volume under under this surface by considering a small element whose volume is dv which is equal to dx dy dz and which is located at distances say y z and x so we can find let us say the location of the centroid for this volume with respect to this plane as x dv integration over the volume. This integral is a triple integral that means we have to integrate along x, y and z axis. Now if we choose proper elements like instead of choosing this kind of an element we can choose for 
this analytical surface a thin column of volume which is having dimensions dy and dx and along the z the length of this column is equal to the z coordinate of the surface and we can now integrate this only along say x and y and we do not need to integrate along the z axis. So, by properly choosing the elements we can convert this triple integral into double integral and in certain cases it can be converted into a single integral also. So, this example clearly illustrates that we take a thin filament whose area cross sectional area is dy times dx and the length of this element is z which is equal to the height of this cylindrical volume for which we are interested to find the location of the centroid. So, for this element z element bar is the location of the centroid which is nothing but z by 2. Okay. And the location of centroid uh, in the x and y directions are x and y itself because we are considering it is as a very small element where dx and dy tends to 0. So, the volume is z times dx dy and now we can find these locations of the centroid x bar, y bar and z bar by these integrals that is x bar v where v is the volume of the cylinder is equal to integral x element bar dv and same way for the location of y and z coordinates of the centroids can be found. We have seen in 2D that if we have a line of symmetry for a plate then the centroid lies along that line of symmetry because the moments, the first moment of the differential elements are symmetrical and that is they are having positive sign on one side or negative side on the other and they cancel out and so the centroid lies along the line of symmetry. The same way we can extend this discussion to the volume and for volumes the first moments have equal magnitude and opposite signs with respect to the plane of symmetry and so the centroid lies on the plane of symmetry. And if we have two planes of symmetry then the centroid lies, let us take an object which is having one plane of symmetry, then the centroid lies in this plane and if it has an another plane of symmetry say this one then the centroid lies along the line that is the intersection of these two symmetrical planes say P1 and P2. And if it had a third symmetrical plane like in case of spheres, we have three planes of symmetry say 1, 2 and then we have the third plane of symmetry thus we have the location of the centroid which is nothing but the center of the sphere itself. 
So, if it is possible to find the planes of symmetry in case of three dimensional objects, then determination of centroids becomes easier and we can do only the required integration along the non symmetrical direction. So, here you see an example where we have two planes of symmetry that is this object is symmetrical about this plane y x as well as it is symmetrical about this plane z x. So, the centroid lies along the line of intersection of these two planes that is the x axis. So, now we are interested to find the location of the centroid along this x axis and for that we consider this thin slab which is parallel to this plane y z or parallel to the plane perpendicular to the axis along which the centroid lies. So, now we take this as the differential elements and integrate it. The location of the centroid for this thin slab is the x coordinate of this element that is x bar element is the x coordinate of this element and the volume of this element dv can be determined from the geometry and now we can integrate it to find this. For objects which are you know symmetrical about this axis, these slabs become circles that means, these becomes thin disks. So, we have the volume as pi r square d x and now we can integrate this integral x element d v to find the first moment of the volume and from this we get this x bar or the location of the centroid along the x axis. So, we saw how to determine these first moments. The first moments help in determining the location of centroids or the point through which we can assume the weight of the distributed body to act as a single concentrated weight. But we cannot differentiate two objects having different distribution of the weight if we only know the centroid or the first moment. So, let us consider say a solid sphere which is having the centroid at its center and say an another sphere which is hollow from inside. That means, when you will cut it, you will have something like like this. So, the inside is hollow. For this solid also, we will see that the centroid lies in the same location. So, if let us say the mass of this sphere and the mass of this sphere are the same and also we have seen that the centroid is same, then we have an equivalent weight acting through this point both in magnitude as well as at the point of location of the uh, load. But the behavior of these two solids will be different when they are subjected to various forces and moments and that is because of this distribution of this mass. Here it is solid and the distribution 
is uniform in any radial direction, but here we see that we have the mass distribution which is not uniform. That means, we do not have any mass up to certain point along any radial line and then we have the mass or it could be other way around like solids which are having different densities which are porous inside and could be solid in the exterior. Their behavior is different when subjected to the forces and moments. So, in order to quantify this we have to take the second moments which will take care of this distribution of the mass. And in this context we will study determining the area moments and later on we can extend this discussion to determine the second moments for mass or what we call as the moment of inertia of mass. In order to study this let us take a distributed force delta f whose magnitude are proportional to the elements say delta a on which they act and also vary linearly with the distance of delta a from a given axis. So, this kind of a situation happens in pure bending of the beams. So, here in this picture you see a cross section of a beam say here we have taken an I section beam and it is subjected to pure bending. So, that means there are no resultant uh, axial forces on this element. So, sum of all these forces will be 0, but here we see that the these forces are compressive in this section that is the top section above this x axis and they are of the opposite sense that is here they are tensile in nature and there sum becomes 0 when we compute it and these forces have a magnitude which is proportional to the distance from the axis. So, we have this delta f equal to k some constant of proportionality times y times of delta a. So, the force in these elements is proportional to the distance that is y. So, if you want to find the resultant we sum all these things that is integral delta f which is k being a constant taken out integral y dA and since this geometry is symmetrical about this axis this first moment integral y dA is 0 and thereby the resultant becomes 0. But if we take the moments of all these forces it will be equal to y times the force the moment arm is y times the force which is k y delta a and so the total resultant moment of all these forces if we say it is m is equal to k y square d a and k being a constant taken out of the integration. So, we have integral y square d a and this quantity that is integral y square d a is nothing but the second moment of the differential area d a and this is helpful to determine the resultant moment. So, in the context of the beams we can say that for the same bending moment that is subjected for, for the same bending moment two beams having different cross section or different cross sectional shapes will develop different distribution of these forces. So, now it is interesting from the point of design to choose cross sections that will resist this bending moment 
better in the sense the distribution of the internal forces will be safe and so the design of these beams and choosing the cross section depends on the cross sectional shape and uh, the distribution that takes place. So, let us see how we determine this quantity that is the second moment for a given area that is integral y square dA. So, we can determine the moments of inertia of an area with respect to x and y axis. We define it as I x the second moment of the area as integral y square dA. So, if we take this picture, we are interested to find the second moment of this total area. So, we take a small differential element dx dy which is situated at a distance of x from the y, y axis and at a distance of y from the x axis. So, if you are interested to find the second moment of this elemental area with respect to the x axis. So, it is equal to the distance of this area from the axis that is y square dA. So, if we integrate it we get the moment of or the second moment of this area or the moment of inertia of the area with respect to this axis. Same way with respect to y we have it as integral x square dA. And for these differential areas the differential moments of inertia d i x and d i y are defined as y square d a and x square d a respectively. So, we can simplify this integration by choosing suitable elements that is we can take thin strips of rectangular shape or triangular shapes depending upon the geometry of the area to simplify the integration. So, here for the same example, we take a thin strip which is horizontal or parallel to the x axis. So, now in order to determine the second moment of this area with respect to this axis that is x axis, we define the second moment of this thin strip d i x with respect to this x axis as y square the dis distance square from the axis times d a the area of this element. What is the area of this element? It is nothing but if this distance is a then a minus x this point on this curve has the coordinate x comma y. times the thickness of this element that is d y. Same way you can do the integration by taking a vertical strip also. In this case, this will be helpful to determine the moment of inertia of this area with respect to the y axis. The differential second moment of this area d i y is defined as x square the square of the distance of this thin strip from the y axis times d a where the area of this element is y times d x, d x being the width of the strip and y the, the height or the length of this strip. So, by choosing these elements the integration becomes simpler that means the double integration has been simplified to single integration. Let us consider for a rectangular plate. For this we consider this horizontal element d a if b is the width of this rectangular area and h the height of the rectangular area. Then area of this 
thin strip is B times dy and it is located at a distance of y from the x axis. So, if we want to find the second moment of this area with respect to the x axis, then we have I x I x equal to integral y square d a where d a is b times d y and so we have the quantity y square b d y which has to be integrated between the limits that is 0 to h where y varies from 0 to h and if we integrate this we have the value as one third b h q. So, since we are going to consider thin rectangular strips for the integration for any other kind of uh, area, these results can be used. Let us see that we have a general curve. Let us say this equation is defined as y is some function of x. So, we define this thin vertical strip, the moment, the second moment of this strip with respect to the x axis is one third width of this strip which is b which is nothing but dx in this case times height cube in this case height is y. So, we have one third y cube dx is the second moment of this thin strip with respect to this x axis and the second moment of this thin strip with respect to the y axis is x square times the area which is y times dx. So, we have d i y as x square y dx. So, if we integrate this between the limits we have the results. So, let us take this example problem. Here you see a triangle for which we are interested to find the second moment of this area with respect to its base that is in this case with respect to the x axis because the base is located on the x axis. So, in order to do that we define a thin horizontal strip of width dy which is located at a distance of y from the x axis. So, if h is the height of the triangle then we have these dimensions that the vertical height of this strip from the base is y. So, the remaining distance is h minus y and if we have b as the base of the triangle then we have to determine what will be the length of this strip at this height of y. For this we can use this two triangles say if I say a b c d e then we can use this triangles A C B and D C E which are symmetric triangles and we can find what will be this L at this height of Y. So, these are the values D I X is the second moment of this strip with respect to the x axis which is y square d a and where d a is l times d y. Now, we have to determine this l. So, from these similar triangles we have l divided by b equal to h minus y divided by y or h minus y divided by the total height h. From this we have what is the length as b times h minus y divided by h 
which gives this value of d a as b times h minus y by h times d y. Now, we can use this area d a in the expression and integrate it to get the location of the centroid or in this case we are interested in the second moment. So, we can find the second moment with respect to the axis. So, integrating this quantity d i x between 0 and h we have i x as integral d i x which is y square d a which is equal to the limits of integration is y from 0 to h y square this d a is nothing but b times h minus y divided by h times d y. So, if we simplify this term we have this as b by h these two being the constants we take it out h y square minus y cube d y and if we integrate it we have this as h y cube by 3 minus y to the power 4 by 4 in the limit of 0 to h and when we put these limits we have i x as b h cube by 12. So, this example illustrated for a simple geometry of a triangle how we use the method of integration and we use elements which reduce the double integration to single integration or we use thin strips instead of differential uh, small elements which vary both in x and y direction. So, now we will discuss the concept of polar moment of inertia of an area. Till now we saw determining the second moments or moment of inertia of the area with respect to x and y axis or the axis in the plane of the area. The polar moment of inertia is the second moment of the area with respect to the axis perpendicular to the plane of the area and this is particularly of interest in the problems concerning the torsion of the cylindrical shafts where we are interested to find the angular uh, twist caused in a shaft because of a given twisting moment. As we saw that the area moments are helpful in determining the forces and that occur in the beams the same way these polar moments are helpful in determining the required you know the quantities when solving torsion problems. Also these quantities help in problems of rotation of slabs where this polar moment of inertia helps in determining the response of this slab for the rotation when subjected to some uh, rotational moments. So, let us take this area d a which is having distance y from the x axis and x from the y axis. So, the second moment of this area with respect to y we have already seen is y square d a. The same way the second moment of this area with respect to the axis that is z axis passing through this point O is nothing but the square of the distance that is r, r square d a. So, if we integrate this quantity we have the polar moment of inertia which we designate it as j with respect to O as integral r square d a. Now, from geometry we know that this r and x and y are nothing but sides of right angle triangle. So, we have r square as x square plus y square. So, the polar moment of inertia can be related to the rectangular moments of inertia by substituting this r square as x square plus y square in the integration and we find that this is equal to integral x square d a plus integral y square d a which is nothing but 
the second moment of the area with respect to y and second moment area of the area with respect to x. Let us take one example. Here we see a circular area and we are interested to find the moment of inertia of the circular area with respect to this diametrical line say with respect to this x axis. So, this problem we solve by first finding the polar moment of inertia with respect to the z axis and then we determine the rectangular moments of inertia that is i x. You will just see why this is uh, convenient because in this case we can take an annular differential element which is located at a distance of u from the z axis and whose thickness is du. So, the polar moment of inertia can be found by considering the polar moment or the moment with respect to the z axis of this element that is u square the distance of this element square times d a the area of this element which is 2 pi r in this case the radius is u times d u or the change in the radius. So, this is the area of this differential element and when we integrate this we get the polar moment of inertia as 2 pi integral 0 to r u cube d u which is nothing but pi by 2 r to the power 4. Now, we have already seen that the sum of the rectangular components or the rectangular moments of inertia i x and i y is equal to j o or the polar moment of inertia and we use this to find i x. In the case of this circular lamina, the moment of inertia with respect to x and the moment of inertia of the area with respect to y are the same by symmetry and so we have this i x is equal to i y the rectangular second moments are the same and so we write j o is equal to sum of the rectangular second moments which is equal to 2 i x or 2 i y both you know being same and from this since we have now determined j o we can determine this i x which has been found as pi by 4 r, r to the power of 4 and this is the same with respect to the other diametrical line that is this y axis also. Now, we define this radius of gyration of the area. For defining this for any element or any area element, if we assume that this element is of a form of a thin strip and if we want to equate the second moment of this thin strip to the second moment of the area, then the distance at which this thin strip will be situated is known as the radius of gyration. So, what are we doing? We are finding an equivalent thin strip which has same second moment with respect to the concerned axis. So, let us say if we have this area A and we are interested to find the second moments with respect to this x and y axis passing through O. Then for finding this second moment with respect to x, we imagine that a thin concentrated area exists whose second moment with respect to this x axis is same as the second moment of this area with respect to the x axis. So, if such a imaginary thin strip exists whose area is same as the area of the area of interest, then we are interested to know the distance at which this thin strip will be located with respect to the axis that is o x. 
So, we equate their second moments. So, we know that I x is equal to k x square times a for this thin strip because k x is the distance of this thin strip and so we have k x as root of I x by a where I x is the second moment of this area with respect to the x axis. So, this is a unique quantity with respect to a given axis and so for various areas that are of engineering importance like we have seen that beams of uh, cross sections like uh, I section or L sections are the typical cross sections. So, we take this radius of gyration as tabulated values to proceed with our engineering calculation. And this is the radius of gyration with respect to x axis. In the same way, we can define the radius of gyration with respect to the y axis by considering an imaginary area having the same area of this element and situated at the distance of k y, then k y is equal to root of i y, the second moment of this area with respect to the y axis divided by a. And if we know these two quantities k x and k y, it is possible to define the radius of gyration with respect to the z axis or the polar axis. Like we assume that this area is now concentrated as a thin annular strip of radius k naught, then the second moment of this area with respect to the z axis which is j naught is equal to k naught square times of a and thus k naught is j naught by a. We know the relation between j naught i x and i y from that we can easily find that k naught square is equal to k x square plus k y square or square of the radius of gyration with respect to x axis plus square of the radius of gyration with respect to y axis equal to the radius of gyration with respect to the polar axis square. If we determine the second moment with respect to a given coordinate system, then we can determine the second moment with respect to a parallel axis. Because if in a particular engineering calculation, the area is now transformed with respect to a given axis, its second moment changes and but we are not interested to compute every time the second moment by let us say a method of integration. So, if we relate the second moment of a given area with respect to two parallel axes, then it will reduce the amount of computation required to compute these values. So, let us consider in this case this axis B B prime which is a centroidal axis that means it passes through the centroid C of a given area. That means the first moment of the area with respect to this axis B B prime is 0. And let us say we have this x axis or this a a prime axis and the distance of a, any given element differential element d a as y from this axis a a prime and if d is the distance between these two parallel axes then the distance of this element d a with respect to this axis is nothing but y minus d or this y prime distance. So, we have this second moment with respect to this axis a a prime as integral y square d a. This y is nothing but y prime plus d and so we write this integration as y prime plus d square times d a. If we expand this, we have integral y prime square d a plus 2 d, d being constant it has been taken out of the integration integral 
y prime dA plus d square integral dA. This quantity is nothing but the first moment of this elemental area dA with respect to this axis B, B prime which is nothing but a centroidal axis and we know that the first moment of the summation of the first moment of the area is 0 with respect to a centroidal axis and this quantity now becomes 0. So, we have this integration as this quantity which is integral y prime square dA which we designate it as i bar plus integral dA is nothing but the area of this element a times d square. This quantity i bar is nothing but the second moment of the area with respect to this axis b b prime or the centroidal axis. So, this quantity i bar is nothing but the second moment of this area with respect to this centroidal axis. So, we now have a relation between the second moment of the area with respect to the centroidal axis and any other axis which is parallel to the centroidal axis and located at a distance of d. You should note that this relation between the two parallel axes is valid only if one of the axes is passes through the centroid of a given area. Okay. So, this point you should note that this relation is valid only if one of the axis is a centroidal axis. Let us take one example to illustrate this. We have this circular lamina of radius r and we are interested to find the moment of the this area or the second moment of this area with respect to a tangential axis t which is situated at a distance of r or the radius of the disc from the centroidal axis. So, we have this i t or the second moment of this area with respect to this tangential axis as the centroidal moment or the moment of inertia of this area with respect to the centroidal axis i bar plus a times d square. These values are available a priori in the sense for our engineering computation for known shapes like circles, triangles and rectangles, it is possible to find the second moment by integration and this can be made as a table and used for computation. And the value of i bar is 1 by 4 pi r to the power of 4, which we have already seen in our earlier example. We have found the moment of inertia with respect to one of the diametrical axis with for a uh, circular lamina as 1 by 4 pi r to the power of 4. And now, we know this, this distance is r and from this we get the moment of inertia with respect to this axis as 5 by 4 pi r to the power of 4. So, we see that we can advantageously use this parallel axis theorem to determine the second moments with respect to the axis parallel to a centroidal axis. So, we can take one more example. Here you see a triangular lamina and B B prime is a centroidal axis. We know the centroid for this triangle is situated at one third of H from the base. And if we know the moment of inertia of this area or the second moment of the area with respect to this axis, then we can find the second moment with respect to this A A prime axis. So, we have I A A prime is equal to the second moment with respect to the centroidal axis plus A D square. And so, if we know the second moment with respect to now this A A prime, which we 
have just computed in one of our earlier uh, examples where we determined the second moment with respect to the base of a, the same triangle and we determined that as 1 by 12 b h cube. So, now we can use this to determine the second moment with respect to the centroidal axis and knowing that this d is one third of h we can determine the second moment as 1 by 36 b h cube with respect to the centroidal axis. So, these examples illustrate how we can use the parallel axis theorem to determine the second moments. So, if we have composite areas then we can determine the second moments by considering the second moments of the individual areas and summing up in order to determine the second moment for the component or the compound area. So, for simpler shapes these are known like for this rectangular area we have these various quantities like the second moment with respect to the centroidal axis say x x prime or the centroidal axis y prime and the polar moment of inertia of this area with respect to the centroid. So, for many areas of standard shapes like triangles, rectangles these quantities are known and a, an area which is composed of such uh, simpler areas we can determine the second moment by considering these individual component areas. So, let us see one example. So, here you see a typical I section cross section for a beam and in order to strengthen this we are actually welding a thin strip or a plate to the top of this I section beam and we are interested to find the moment of inertia and the radius of gyration with respect to an axis which is parallel to this plate and which passes through the centroid of this section. It is given that the moment of inertia of only the beam section for an axis which is parallel to the plate and passing through the centroid the centroid of this beam section is this O itself because we see that it has two axis of symmetry and it passes through O and so with respect to this axis it is given as 385 centimeter to the power of 4. Now, in order to determine the moment of inertia and radius of gyration we decompose into the areas for which we know these quantities. So, now we decompose this into two areas that is one the I section and other the plate and we determine the centroid of the section first. In order to determine that we have the areas of individual sections that is the beam section for which the value is 11.20 centimeter square and for plate which is 9 centimeter by 3 meters the area is 6.75 centimeter square. The location of the centroid for the beam section is 0 with respect to this x axis because you know it is symmetrical about this x axis. So, y bar is 0 and for this thin plate also the first moment is 50.12 for the plate and 7.425 for this plate. This quantity can be found by parallel axis. So, we have the summation of this area as 17.95 and 
sigma y bar a as 50.12. So, from this we can determine the centroidal location of this composite section with respect to this axis o x which is y bar sigma a equal to sigma y bar a or the location of the centroid of component areas. So, from this we determine the location as 2.792 centimeters. Now, we can determine the second moment with respect to the axis passing through this centroid C for this composite section. So, we have this I x for the beam section as I x with respect to its centroidal axis plus the area of the cross section of the beam section times y bar square and which has been determined as 472.3 centimeter to the power of 4 and for the plate section again by using the parallel axis theorem we have I x prime plate is equal to I x bar plus A d square where A is the area of the plate and d is the distance of this plate with respect to this axis and we have this quantity as 145.2 centimeter to the power of 4. So, now we can determine for the complete section as sum of these moments which is equal to 618 centimeter to the power 4. So, these problems illustrated how we can use this parallel axis theorem for computing the second moments of the area.